You have no idea how excited I was when I heard I get to sit on a throne. <laughs> Very good. Anyway. Thank you, Secretary Kerry, for that hugely important speech. And before we open up to questions from the audience, I want to pick up on just a couple of the things that you, you spoke about. And the first intergenerational challenge that you spoke about was the existence of extremist groups around the world, but in particular the ongoing conflict in Syria. And you mentioned how it's only now, years into the conflict, that we're finally getting all the parties together, making some progress and saving lives. And the question I want to ask is, how do you think that history will view the lack of direct involvement in 2013? Do you think that if there had been more direct action, then the deterioration of the country would have been stopped or slowed? Rob, I don't, I don't want to disappoint you, but I'm just not in the business of, uh, of uh, hypothetical retroactive judgments now. I'm, I got another eight months, and I'm looking forward and trying to figure out how we deal with the problem we have now. And I can't just, it's a waste of time for me to surmise whether or not if we did something, I, I mean, I wasn't secretary at the time, uh, or even when I did become secretary, uh, we have to go forward. Now, here's, here's the dilemma of Syria, folks. It, it, when I talk about the complications, it's, uh, <laughs> there are probably, I don't know, five wars going on there. It's not just the Syrian war. It's, it's Kurd versus Kurd. There are different Kurd interests. Kurd versus Turkey. Uh, Saudi Arabia right now has major challenge with Iran, and that complicates uh, the challenge. You have Hezbollah on the ground and fighting in uh, Syria, which has an impact on Israel's perceptions of threat and our perceptions of threat as a result also as an ally and friend uh, of Israel. Uh, together with Great Britain and others. You have the fight against Daesh, ISIL, and fight against Nusra. They have different sort of interests. And then you have, of course, um, the uh, Shia Sunni undercurrent uh, that uh, is too much uh, used as an excuse for doing one thing or other. You also have Persian Arab divide here. So you put all those pieces together and you have a very toxic kind of cocktail that's very difficult to work with. Uh, and there are some players who have different interests about what the long-term outcome might be. Uh, whether or not uh, a 65% Sunni country should in fact be, uh, you know, more uh, in the uh, sphere of influence of the other Sunni countries and so forth, which is not a great recipe for resolving, obviously, uh, a, a secular state that is disinterested in those labels and trying to move to a different place. So what we're trying to do is get, which is the art of diplomacy, is to define the interests of all the parties and see where the sweet spot is that those interests can come together and hopefully be able to thread a very thin needle. And, and that's the challenge of Syria. It's as complicated as any uh, conflict that I've seen in the entire time I've been in public life. But getting Iran to the table, getting Saudi Arabia and the rest of the GCC and other countries to the table, together with Russia, uh, and the regime committed to at least show up in Geneva, is the beginning of how you try to shape an outcome. And I can't sit here and guarantee you, President Obama can't guarantee you that, that it's going to happen automatically. But if you don't try, it certainly isn't going to happen. And after 12 million people displaced and 4 million refugees plus, and, the, and obviously the challenge not just to Europe, but to the stability of Jordan, of Lebanon, and Turkey, we have a profound urgency in trying to resolve this, and that's, that's what we're trying to do. So that's where my focus of energy is. And I'm gonna promote any tool that I think will make that difference. I will promote to President Obama, um, and you'll respect the fact that I will reserve that for him and not all of you here today. Thank you. Uh, the second challenge you spoke about is about how important it is for, to have faith in government, and that the fundamental duty of government is to look after its citizens. But you were criticising only foreign countries there. And what people might, might think is that actually there's a certain individual who doesn't inspire great faith 
in the general public who perhaps wouldn't look after all of the citizens of his country equally, that person, of course, being Donald Trump. And I would like to know what do you think has happened to America to enable the possibility of someone like Donald Trump being elected? And what do you think are the real threats of a Trump presidency to America's foreign policy? Well, uh, this again is not going to satisfy you, Rob, and I'm sorry about that, but um, I'm not allowed under our law to get into, uh, actually full-throatedly into the middle of uh, the campaign. So, and particularly in my job, it, it's important that I don't do that. Um, enough will be written, enough you all will see the debates, you'll make your own judgments. Um, but, I, but it's important just to talk about the issues and where people fall on the, on, on the spectrum of those issues. I do think, and I've said this before publicly, it seems to me pretty fundamental that anybody running for president ought to be able to be declarative and clear and supportive of new energy policies that deal with climate change. And I think people have to judge whether or not one party or the other or one candidate or another is doing that. But um, I'm not going to get into the other pieces of the, of the, you know, there are all kinds of issues like that that everybody will measure. Um, the American people are, are uh, very capable in the end of uh, making this decision. There are five months to go. There'll be an enormous amount of back and forth on it. And I know you wish you could vote in Europe. And in fact, uh, uh, going back to 2004, so do I. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> um, well, you, you mentioned Europe, so picking up very quickly on Europe, do you support President Obama's comments that if Britain were to leave the European Union, we would then have to join the back of the queue for negotiating a trade deal with America? Well, look, let me begin my answer by being as clear as President Obama was that this is a decision for the voters in Britain to make. This is not our vote. And we do not want to, uh, we're not trying to put ourselves in a campaign and we don't want to kibitz in an inappropriate way. But do we have a point of view about our relationship with Great Britain? Of course we do. We are security partners. We are major partners at many tables in the world where we work together to further the interests of our countries together, our values. We share values, we share interests. And, and President Obama was very clear that uh, we believe the, 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 the presence of, uh, of, of Britain in uh, the EU magnifies its voice, strengthens its ability to be, have an impact on global events. And that if indeed uh, the decision were made and your voters make that decision, of course we'll respect it, but the reality is that in a trade agreement, we're gonna be looking to 27 countries, not to one. We're going to be trying to maximize the marketplace and get the rules in as many countries as we can because that's the way it's effective. So certainly it's going to have, uh, it'll have impacts like that. And, 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 you know, we're not trying to come in here and beat a drum, but you ask me a question and I tell you from our point of view, we have an interest too in the magnified voice and strength of Britain. And we want that partnership and we think it's stronger to have a united Europe than not. Thank you. We're going to open up to the audience. If you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand up high, wait for the microphone to come round to you, and please stand whilst asking your question. Can we please go to the question from the gentleman in the blue checkered shirt on the third row? Thank you very much. Uh, I loved your talk. Uh, I'm from Michigan, a uh, fellow American. Uh, and I wanted to know, um, Mr. Secretary, how your perspective on the United States has changed since switching roles from a senator to our chief diplomat and spending most of your time outside of America? Well, it's a great question. Uh, the gridlock of Congress is a, is a challenge. Uh, I thought it was a challenge when I was in Congress. I didn't like it. I was frustrated by it. Um, it's, it's only gotten worse. And I think it penalizes our country. I think it hurts us very, very much in terms of addressing the concerns and needs not only of ourselves, but of uh, you know, our role of, leader, of, of leadership in the world. 
it's had an effect on I mean, look, imagine, it, it's very hard for me to go to a country where we're working on a diplomatic level with our embassy, fully immersed with that country and trying to help them with their budget problems. And I sit there with the prime minister and the finance minister and I say, hey, you gotta really get your budget done. And they look at me, you know, uh, really? Uh, so how are you doing on your budget? I mean, it's just, we, we, we lose some credibility and leverage in those kinds of things. I also think we are hurting ourselves, all the things I just laid out. I, I, feel, I feel passionately about this. These problems are solvable. But we're not gonna solve them if we turn away and pretend we're just gonna take care of ourselves or they're gonna go away by themselves. They're not. You have to fight for it. I mean, I know how hard a fight it was in our country to beat back organized crime at one period of time. Uh, I was involved in it in 1970s. We had some, too much of it going on. Rudy Giuliani in New York, a bunch of us as young prosecutors starting going after it. Uh, if, you know, go see the movie The Departed uh, and, and uh, the newest movie about Whitey Bulger and you'll see the guys that we were dealing with. So you have to fight that because if you don't, they intimidate everybody in a community and in society. And then you have alternative power bases and you have a struggle for legitimacy and if you don't fight back against those things, you lose that legitimacy. That's the problem in the governance. It's that it loses credibility. And so elected leaders are tragically less the validators of a particular point of view and position than they used to be. And there are many reasons for this, by the way. We mentioned this at, at lunch, I think, today, that you know, in the modern world, I mean, everybody's running around in some of these countries I'm talking about with smartphones. And, and they look at their phone and they're in touch with the rest of the world. They might get an Instagram, they might get a tweet, they might, whatever it is. But there always, there's a lot of communication going on. And people are obviously getting less of their input from nightly television news or the newspaper or wherever. And, and that changes governance. I've been stunned by how much that changes governance. It, it, it's hard to uh, build consensus if everybody has the privilege of creating their own facts. And that's the world we're living in now. And who's the arbiter? Who's the referee? And a lot of people never hear from a referee. So they're proceeding forward in a political party or in a point of view that is completely based on a, a total misunderstanding of a particular issue. When I was growing up, if a president of the United States wanted to talk to the nation, the president's people would call the network and say, we want to block, we need to, you know, the president needs to give an Oval Office speech tonight, and the whole nation would sort of stop. Because you only had four channels, basically, ABC, NBC, CBS, and, and public television. And everybody would watch, and the next day at work, everybody was talking about what the president said. And you'd debate the policy. That doesn't happen in the same way. A lot of television now is self-selecting. People go to the network that they already know is gonna give them the news the way they like to hear it. So it's a problem for governance. And, and you ask, what have I noted? I mean, this is what I have learned in this time as secretary. It's very hard uh, to build up uh, the momentum you need behind the, 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 the uh, size of choices that have to be made. And uh, I think President Obama has done remarkably well considering that uh, he's been sort of under assault from the get-go. And there's been this incredible uh, sort of opposition to almost anything because it comes from him. That's not what the citizens expect from us. That's why you're seeing this fight in our country as well as elsewhere in the world where people are angry and reflecting that anger in the political process, which is why, again, I say to you, democracy has its way of providing that outlet. And if you don't have that outlet, you have a lot of other sometimes, you know, really dangerous outcomes in, in various places in the world. Thank you. Let's go to the question from the lady in the white jacket on the second row. <clears throat> Hello, I'm a graduate of your alma mater, St. Paul's School, from last year, so hi. Um, 
Um, and you spoke about the importance of a transition in Syria um, to a, a smooth transition to democracy. But do you have a plan to prevent in Syria what we saw happen in Egypt? Um, and if so, to what degree do you think the United States and the UK and other Western powers should be involved in that transition? Well, we are involved because the International Syria Support Group is working with the parties to try to get them to write their own constitution. They need to write it. We can't impose, and we shouldn't impose, a solution, nor would we be able, I mean, we're just not able to anyway, but we shouldn't even think of that. We have to work with the parties, with the support nations of each party, playing a role with that party to get them to compromise and to understand the imperatives here. Russia and Iran have the ability to have an impact on Syria and the regime. We, with the rest of most of the Syria support group, are supporters of the opposition, the moderate opposition. Nusra and Daesh are outside of any deal whatsoever and they're not included in the cessation of hostilities. That's part of the confusion that adds to the difficulty of actually getting peace because it is legitimate to continue for us and the Russians and the regime to go after Nusra or Daesh. The problem is that's not all they're going after and, and that's where the tension comes. Now, coming back to your question, I believe that uh, if we work hard at it, it is possible to put a scenario on the table which could lead to a solution. The only issue is, is Assad serious and will the people who support him make him serious? Because so far, he has said he's not willing to talk about the presidency. He's not there, you know, it's not a, a, up for grabs. And there'll be no discussion about him transferring his presidential authority. So in effect, he's come to the table, but not yet of a mindset to actually negotiate. Uh, that's where Russia and Iran are going to have to become more involved. Now, Russia and Iran have both signed on to three communiques out of the Syria support group and have supported a United Nations Security Council resolution that embraces a political negotiation, a transitional governance body that would run Syria while the constitution is being written and implemented and then a, a ceasefire nationwide and an election in a year and a half. Now we're now already five months in, so it'd be a year and whatever. But that's the envisioned outcome of Iran and Russia. It's pretty similar to ours. The issue is, are they gonna really push Assad to embrace it? If he doesn't, the ceasefire will completely fall apart they will go back to war, uh, barring some other kind of intervention, which I don't necessarily see on the horizon right now. Thank you. We've got time for just one more quick question. Can we please go to the member in the aisle on the third row? We can, we can probably take one, maybe one more. Let's see. John? Do we have five minutes? Or, yeah. Thank you for your talk. Um, how do you deal with the conflict between the goals that you set in particular um, by fighting mic, ISIS. Hold the mic closer. I'm sorry. sorry. Um, thank you for your talk. How do you deal with the conflict between your goals? So, for instance, um, by fighting ISIS, that means actively supporting states which are endemically corrupt, which don't share our belief that women are equal, um, and who have also a vested interest in radical ideology. You know, um, we live in an uneven world. And the world of diplomacy is particularly uneven because it absolutely requires that you have to deal with people with whom you may have fundamental differences and disagreements. Uh, that's been true all through history, by the way. I mean, you know, when we had a Soviet Union, every president, Republican and Democrat alike, dealt with the Soviet Union. The great Satan, or, you know, these were, and they had a name for us. I mean, we were back and forth. But we both dealt with each other. When Gorbachev and 
Uh, Reagan met in Reykjavik, they managed to come out of a room and say, we're going to go down from 50,000 warheads, then deployed, uh, to zero. Now, no, we knew we wouldn't get to zero immediately, but their dream was to begin to move away from nuclear weapons. That's what they expressed. We're now down to 1,500 plus, somewhere in that vicinity, and we would like to go further down. Because every step you take moving towards denuclearization, if you are dealing with conflict resolution and being smart, uh, you can make the world safer. Now, recognizing that, do you not deal with them? It's the same thing with Syria. There are different countries at different stages of development. Uh, I'm sure you're all studying the different stages of development in, in, in you know, less developed country and where they move, how they move and how they grow and how things change. You know, some 300, 400 million people have been brought out of poverty in India. There's a middle class, but there's still 400 million people who still have to come out. Same thing with China. China's brought somewhere 450, 500 million people out of, out of, into the middle class, but there are another 450 million people who have to come out of agrarian society into modernity. A lot of these countries in the Middle East are in a different place. First of all, they were oil dependent for years and years. Their economies were built on oil. Nobody foresaw this, or moved at least, if they did foresee it, to create an economy that was sustainable without it. That's what Saudi Arabia is doing now. You look at what they just announced, this 2030 plan, it's interesting. It's challenging. It, it has huge possibilities. It's not easy to affect, but they're trying to ratchet down the, 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 the percentage of their economy dependent on oil and grow the capacity of people to build things, to invent, to provide services, to do all the other things in life that need to be done. And, and it's, it's uh, you know, we can't just say, wow, you're a monarchy or you're this or you don't allow this or, you know, therefore we're not going to talk to you. The other thing is we have to recognize, this is a lesson I have learned as secretary. We have to be humble in our own sense of self. Uh, I often hear American, you know, fellow American talk in terms of, and you've heard them talk in terms of the exceptionalism theory. Uh, and I think we are exceptional, but I don't think we're exceptional because we say we are, because we brag about it. I think we're exceptional and have to be exceptional because we do exceptional things, like helping Britain to liberate, uh, you know, help to win World War II, or help to end AIDS in Africa, or help to cut off Ebola, or do things like that. That's where multilateralism and dealing with people is critical no matter who they are. So you have to be measured in where people come from culturally, religiously, historically, and what their system is and how fast they can move to embrace modernity. And part of what is happening today, I think, is a clash with modernity that is uncontrolled for some people. They don't quite know how to manage it. It's frightening. And, and so we have to learn more effectively how to manage that ourselves. And the first requirement in my mind is being willing to talk to people, even people you disagree with, and not just talk, but listen to them. You know, I think diplomacy requires really good listening to be most effective. I think Kathy Ashton would ratify that 100 times over. The Secretary has agreed to take one final question. Can we please go to uh, the question right in the back corner of the chamber? With the glasses, you sir. Okay. Thank you, uh, Secretary Kerry. Um, I just wanted to ask a quick question. Um, as we come to the end of the Obama administration, whilst you've still got eight months left in office, I was just wondering, in reflection, what your proudest accomplishments were, uh, are as a Secretary of State, and then also what you think are the proudest achievements of the Obama administration in general? Well, that's asking me to be sort of retrospectively judgmental, but I, I, 
I mean, obviously, uh, I think that uh, the Global Climate Change Agreement in Paris and the Iran nuclear agreement and the Cuba opening, uh, the efforts in Afghanistan to hold it together and can transition Afghanistan, uh, cutting, ending Ebola as a global threat uh, through the decision the president made to send 3,000 troops there when we didn't know all the answers, but to build capacity and deliver care and aid, very gutsy decision. Uh, you know, I think those, uh, those things, that TPP, the trade, Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership, uh, the, uh, uh, that's 40% of the global economy that's coming under a new trading mechanism. It's one of the reasons why we urge Europe to, to get on board and be part of this, because uh, it's a race to the top, not a race to the bottom. It's higher standards, it's better environment, environment standards are within the four corners of the agreement, labor standards are within the four corners of the agreement. So I think these are big breakthroughs. And I think for the president, obviously, to have put uh, universal health care in place in the United States is a extraordinary accomplishment, not to mention bringing the economy of the world back from the brink in the first days of his presidency and preventing a global depression is an extraordinary accomplishment. So I think those are the biggest things of all. I'm afraid that's all we have you know, time. My question was the last thing between me and my beer at the pub. Yeah. I want you to know. We wouldn't want to keep Thank you any longer. All right. Thank I'm you. I'm afraid that's all we have time for. As a small token of our appreciation and in recognition of this being the first visit by a sitting US Secretary of State to the Oxford Union, we would like to present you with a couple of gifts. First of all is a photograph of this historic yeah. chamber. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and secondly, we have decided to elect you as an honorary member of the Oxford Union. There are, there are only 14 living honorary members uh, at this moment in time, including Malala Yousafzai, Sir Elton John. It's a delight to add you to that list. Um, you, many congratulations. Thank you very Thank you. much.